This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Help others discover UCTV podcasts by leaving a comment or rating for us in iTunes. Now, I do want to then introduce our speaker, Tom Smith. And Tom Smith I owe a lot to because he was on the committee that recruited me to be the director of the Institute. And I remember his words just before I took, uh, took on the job, oh, come on, you'll have fun. Thanks a lot, Tom. <laughs> Actually, I have had a lot of fun. And Tom, of course, is the director of the Center for Tropical Research. He has done, for over 25 years, groundbreaking research right across the tropics, South America, Central America, but a special, special focus in the Congo Basin in West Africa, where he's established a UCLA center right in Cameroon, a center which not only tackles with conservation, but also deals with public health issues. I mean, we're taking lessons we learn here, the science here, and we're bringing it to some of the people that are probably least developed in the whole world in West Africa, and we're helping the people not just the species, not just the natural environment here. And, and so we have a chance here to, to, to hear from somebody not only who's very accomplished, but is very, very passionate, has walked the walk, talked the talk, and done, done more than I think anyone I, I know uh, in terms of if his research and, and really helping people as well as the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, really and a remarkable, remarkable person, someone I feel very proud to know uh, as a colleague and a friend, Tom Smith. So. Um, I'd like to especially thank uh, the Oppenheim family for making tonight possible, in particular Tina and Pat uh, Oppenheim, uh, for their tremendous support of the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. It just means a lot. So thank you. The rainforests of the Congo Basin are tremendously rich in plants and animals, second only to the Amazon. Tonight, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the region, the challenges, and some of the solutions for preserving biodiversity. In Cameroon, where I've worked, uh, done research now for almost 30 years, the diversity is stunning. Similar in size to the state of California, Cameroon sits between Nigeria and the Central African Republic in the Gulf of Guinea. To the west is Mount Cameroon, <clears throat> Africa's third highest volcano, reaching almost 14,000 feet. To the north are the savannas that reach up to Lake Chad, and to the south are the lush tropical rainforests that form the northwest boundary of the Congo forest. Cameroon is one of the most biodiverse countries in Africa. Many of the country's plants and animals are found only there, nowhere else in Africa. It's home to a stunning array of birds, over 900 species, and over 300 species of mammals including is an extraordinary diversity of primates, over 29 different species of, of primates, from the very small red-eared guinin to the median-sized putty-nosed monkey to two forest baboons, the mandrel and the drill, both critically endangered, but found this is, Cameroon is the only country where you find both of them. And of course, there's also great apes, such as chimpanzees and lowland gorillas and also some extraordinary species, such as the Cross River Gorilla. This is a species that um, was discovered in the early 1900s. It turns out it's a subspecies of lowland gorilla, and it was thought to be extinct. Everyone thought it was gone, and then in the late 80s, they rediscovered it in some isolated mountains in Nigeria. There's only about 300 of these left. They're sort of the equivalent of the, of the mountain gorilla of West Africa. In 1983, as a new graduate student, I traveled to the rainforests of southern Cameroon. This sort of tells you how long I've been doing this. Um, at the time, there was one international airport in the port city of Douala and very few paved roads. Traveling the dirt road between Douala and Yaoundé was often a horrendous adventure, sometimes taking two days. It was only 150 miles. But over the years, I've worked in virtually every corner of the country, from some of the most remote 
uh, rainforest areas to some of the savanna areas where we've worked, sometimes going in, taking uh, three or four days, even a week to get into a single site to survey. But we were always rewarded by spectacular scenery. This is Nagang Ha. This is an isolated mountain range in central Cameroon. We were the first biologists to ever uh, venture into this area, and we found many interesting discoveries there of plants and animals. Early on, I lived for three years in a tented camp near the small village of Ndibi. And I returned to this site, I returned to this site every, every year for the past 30 years, sometimes to do research. We still have projects there, but sometimes just to visit old friends. This is uh, Etienne and his wife, Emilienne, and their daughter, Brenda, named after my wife. And uh, I actually started working with Etienne when he was about 10 years old, and he was the best nest finder in the village. And this meant a lot to me uh, for my dissertation, believe me. So we got to be great colleagues, and he just was a tremendous, uh, tremendous asset. He's now gone on to get a nursing degree, and he's uh, practicing in Equatorial Guinea. Another place we've done long-term research is in the Jaw Reserve. This is what Tina mentioned. Uh, the Jaw Reserve is in South Central Cameroon. It's a biosphere reserve. It's one of the most spectacular tracts of rainforest you can imagine. Uh, we had a camp located about 30 kilometers from the nearest road where that star is. And we focused our research there on trying to understand the role that, that animals play in moving seeds and dispersing seeds. So we, looked, we worked on both birds and primates. We had a camp uh, at that site. This is, our, this is what it looked like back in the early 90s, a fantastic spot. And we had graduate students working there 24-7. You could sit on this canopy in the evening and watch monkeys come down and swim in our swimming hole about 30 feet away. And they did that because they knew it was safe. They weren't afraid of us, but they were certainly afraid of the leopards that were often come down and try to nab them when they were taking a bath. This is the first team that uh, worked out in the area. This is uh, Ken Whitney, uh, who uh, is now a professor at the University of New Mexico. Mark Fogill, a botanist, and there are other assistants. But the most phenomenal people in this group, of course, are our Baca Pygmy guides, that we couldn't have done this project without them. They know every animal, every plant. They know every seedling of every plant, and they know every sound of the forest. They are the true forest people, and we wouldn't have had any chance of doing this project without them. This is Augustin, who was our chief guide back then. And we get back to this area, too. Though we don't have the camp anymore, we still get back to do research in the area. This is Augustin 20 years later. Uh, this was taken last year uh, in, uh, in, their, in their village of Bufilong, and he's now the, uh, the chief of the village. So while there's still tremendous biodiversity left in Cameroon, the situation is changing very fast. The exploitation of timber, oil, natural gas, and minerals is intensifying, and that means new roads and rail lines moving into pristine areas and uh, increasing pressures on wildlife populations. The first scramble for Africa occurred between 1881 and 1914 and involved the invasion, occupation, and eventual annexation of African territory by European powers. Led in large part by China, a second scramble for natural resources is now underway, and Cameroon is in the crosshairs. If we just look at timber for a moment, China is the largest importer. Uh, if we look at deforestation here on the uh, y-axis and Chinese imports, you see there's a very positive trend there. Uh, wildlife trafficking is also a very serious problem for many species. Millions of metric tons are consumed annually in the Congo Basin. This hunter has uh, the white, some white-nosed, uh, some putty-nosed monkey, and this is a mustache monkey. Elephants have been particularly hard hit um, by trafficking. It's estimated that over 30,000 elephants are killed every year in Africa. And believe me, this number is not sustainable. By weight, ivory now is more valuable than gold. Last year alone, there were 200 animals that were uh, gunned down by uh, rebel groups that came in across the border and uh, killed 200 elephants in two days. But the environmental consequences of wildlife tracking, uh, trafficking extend far beyond 
simply these loss of these wonderful animals. It turns out that most rainforest trees require animals to disperse their seeds. In fact, in Cameroon, about 85 to 90 percent of the trees are dispersed by vertebrates. And so when you lose these critical vertebrates, you lose the ability of the forest to regenerate. So in the case of elephants, uh, they're really the king of the dispersers. They disperse over 100 species of tree. We've looked at this question. Uh, this is some work that uh, one, of my uh, one of my graduate students, Ben Wong, did here at UCLA for his thesis. And he looked at the impacts of hunting on a tree that's dispersed by primates. And he compared protected forest and, and hunted forest. Uh, the hunted forest, of course, is without primates, and the protected forests are with primates. And what he found was that in protected forest, most of the seeds are dispersed away from the tree, about 90 percent, whereas only a few fall under, a few percentage fall under the, uh, the mother tree. Whereas in hunted forest, 95 or so percent of the seeds fall under the parent tree and simply rot and aren't dispersed away. Now the consequences of this are really quite significant because it means that these seeds are not being moved away and we're seeing a contraction in genetic variation because of it. So genetic neighborhoods in this, in this study, in the, in the protected, um, what, what he found in the study was that genetic neighborhoods were 55 percent smaller in hunted forests. So, so this, is a, this is a really serious matter when you start losing the capacity of these forests to, to generate and maintain genetic diversity. Another pressing problem, of course, is human population growth. Uh, African populations are expected to quadruple by the end of the century, and by 2050, global food needs are expected to rise about 100 percent. And the epicenter of agricultural growth in the tropics is going to be in places in, like Africa, in the tropics. So that's more land for people, less for wildlife. In sub-Saharan Africa, there is also a massive growth underway right now for mining. Uh, much of it, again, led by China. The predicted growth of the middle class worldwide is estimated to approach about 5 billion in the next 17 years. And so this means that uh, folks are going to want you know, the things that come along with being in the middle class. And so much of the natural resources uh, to meet this demand are going to come from Africa. And this is a, this is a, a pretty stunning uh, map of mining claims in southeastern Cameroon. So it's just this little bit of the country. These are mining claims. This is cobalt, iron ore, diamonds, et cetera. Some of, these, uh, some, of these some of these claims actually extend into the reserves, such as the Biosphere Reserve. Our camp is right there. Now, what has, what has reduced the amount of, well, I should, what's, hold this, what's held this at bay in terms of just outright exploitation is the fact that it's very hard to move minerals out of Africa. You need to put it on trucks, you need to move it to the port, and you need to get it on ships. And so the logistics of doing that is, uh, is slowed the, the pace of mineral development, but this is changing. Last July, while we were doing field work, uh, Mark Gold and I and some others were down south of Creeby visiting one of my field sites, and we discovered to my, uh, to my horror that my entire field site had been uh, basically uh, eliminated. There's a, a, a deep water port that's being built. It extends 30 kilometers down the coast. It's probably about uh, almost the size of the Port of LA already. It's a massive port. It's one of the largest uh, construction projects in Africa right now. And it will have rail links into all the way into the deepest, darkest parts of Africa. Um, so what does that mean for the Congo Basin? Well, what we did was to reconstruct the rail links that are going to connect to this port. This is what it looks like. It's a, basically a spider web. Uh, reaching every country and, and into all parts of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And in fact, uh, there's another port being constructed now in East Africa that's going to connect all of these rail lines. But these represent only a few of the challenges. Uh, this year, the world's CO2 surpassed 400 parts per million in the atmosphere, and the pace of climate change is now faster than any period in the past 65 million years of the history of the Earth. A fifth of all fossil fuels have been burned since 2002. 
And by 2020, 250 million people are going to be, are predicted to face water shortages. The situation for biodiversity is pretty grave. Um, it's estimated that um, if the global average uh, temperature rises to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels, uh, we look to lose uh, probably about 30% of the plants and animals uh, in Africa. Um, if you've been reading the paper, you know there's a latest, there's a new climate report that's just come out. In fact, um, these estimates have been, um, uh, uh, are now predicted to be even more than that. The uh, predicted increase, even for a moderate scenario, is now three degrees. Uh, so this means that uh, we're looking at a, uh, a very serious situation for plants and animals. And in fact, for mammals, it's predicted that we may lose 40% of all African mammals uh, by the end of the century. So what can we do? What can be done? How can we save Africa's biodiversity in the face of this onslaught and find sustainable solutions? What I'd like to do is to discuss three projects that we have underway that we think can make a difference for both people and biodiversity. But first, let me start with some background and focus on some of the threats of climate change and how they might be mitigated. Um, well, first of all, let's talk about um, the best way we can protect species um, in the face of climate change. How can we do this? Well, one of the ways that conservation organizations have, have focused is on hotspots. That is, protecting areas with a lot of species where, uh, that are under threat and sort of focus your conservation efforts on this, these areas. The problem with this is that there, there are some problems with hotspots, and there, there are essentially two problems. The first is that under climate change, obviously the hotspots of today might not be the hotspots of tomorrow. Species are going to be changing in distributions. So for example, if we go back to look at what's happened in rain shifts over the last 14,000 years, we can see that collared lemmings, which used to live in Montana, have moved up into the high Arctic, almost 1,600 kilometers. So that's, that's the first problem. Uh, is that uh, distributions are going to be changing. The second problem is that the, the hotspots themselves may not preserve the processes that give rise to biodiversity. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you can imagine that uh, you have a hotspot here uh, again, but you may have an area outside of it in this red area which is very important in the generation of new species. In other words, the processes that produce biodiversity may lay outside. And so you certainly wouldn't want to protect this area without this area. So what's a better way? What's a better way to try to protect, maximize the amount of biodiversity that we can protect under climate change? Well, one approach is to try to predict, predict, predict or protect as much adaptive variation as possible. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you can imagine a, a range of bird species here, some that feed on seeds and some that feed on nectar. And the idea here would be to protect as many of those different forms as possible with the hope that some of them are gonna come out the other side. Some will be persist in the face of climate change. Now, so this is really a sort of a balanced stock portfolio approach. You don't know what the future is going to bring, but you hedge your bets and you, you have a diversified portfolio. Now, this is much better than saying just protecting uh, small billed birds down here and hoping that you're going to get through uh, into the future. This would be sort of the equivalent of just investing in tech stocks, I guess. So where is, where is adaptive variation concentrated? Where can we find it? If we want to preserve it, where is it found? Well, it turns out that, for the most part, adaptive variation is often concentrated along gradients, along ecological gradients. So when I speak of gradients, uh, think about California for a minute. Think about the, um, as you drive from the foothills of the Sierras up into the high mountain meadows. You're moving across a vegetational gradient. Those habitats change as you drive up in elevation. And as you move up in elevation, those species that occur along that gradient change as well. They're under different selection pressures, so they, they change as those, those populations move up in elevation. You can think about it this way. This is Mount Cameroon. Imagine a small-bodied bird that lives at the base of this mountain. And as you hike to the peak of this mountain, you find that um, 
the species gets larger and larger. This is the variation I'm talking about. So in terms of protecting this area, what you would want to do is preserve an area from the top to the bottom of the mountain to try to capture as much of this variation as possible. So can protecting gradients offer a kind of bed hedging strategy for preserving adaptive variation under climate change? Well, for the past 20 years, um, we've been focused on this question and the role of gradients in producing adaptive variation, but also their role in speciation, how, how new species emerge from this, uh, this pattern of change across gradients. The gradient that we've been looking at, this is Africa, by the way. This is a vegetation map. And you can see the Congo Basin here, the Congo Forest, and the savannas up here in red. And then this ecotone habitat between the savanna and the forest. And that's the gradient that we're talking about. It's called an ecotone. It's just a transition area between two biomes. Looking a little closer, you can zoom in, and you can see that this transitional area, or ecotone, is made up of forest fragments of varying size floating in this sort of sea of, of, of savanna, which is shown here in pink. If we look at um, the different ends of this gradient, this would be uh, typical of the forest area. So we would sample down in these areas, uh, working on birds. This is actually, by the way, this is along an elephant trail. You can see the elephant footprints, these post holes here. And you can actually use these trails to, to catch birds. It works really well. You don't have to clear trails, except if an elephant walks through. <laughs> and then um, all bets are off. You lose another net, and the elephant's walking off with all your nets dangling behind it. The other end of the, the gradient looks like this. This is an ecotone fragment, a forest fragment here floating in this sea of savanna. If you go into this forest, you find many rainforest species that have been isolated there. But morphologically and physiologically, they're different. They're living in this different environment. And so we were very interested in looking at this sort of progression of adaptive change across this gradient. So in the early 1990s, uh, we started working on this species. Uh, this is the little green bull, uh, pretty much the drabest bird you can imagine in Africa. It's, uh, it's, but it's very, it's, 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 it's very, very, um, it's a very important species for two reasons. It's very, very common, and it's easily caught in mist nets, and so you can study it. And so we began a study of this species to try to understand how variation in this species changes along this gradient. So if we look at um, some data from little green bulls, um, if we look at morphological divergence on this axis, which is just some measure of wing length or bill size or leg length, and compare it to geographic distance along the x-axis, what we find is that when you compare different habitats across this gradient, such as forest and ecotone, the blue dots are up here. In other words, there's more morphological divergence per unit distance. Whereas if you look at within habitats, either forest, forest, or ecotone, ecotone, they all sit down here. And so what this is telling us is that this divergence that's occurring across this ecotone, we're seeing changes in traits that we know to be important in, in the survival of these species. Now, we've done a lot of other work on this. Uh, we've looked at the genetic patterns of these changes along this gradient. And I'm not going to go into all the details of this, except to say that when you combine the genetic information with information on the morphology of the species, it's basically a pattern that's consistent with um, a, a theory of, of, of speciation based on over 40 years of laboratory work on fruit flies. In other words, what we're finding is that these gradients are very important not only in adaptive variation, but also in the progression to new species. Now, one way that you always want to look at species and, and try to, when you're studying evolution and speciation, is to try to understand the role of song. Because in bird song, it's really critical. We know birds sing different songs, and um, that uh, reproductive isolation and what isolates different populations when uh, birds are speciating, speciating often has to do with the type of song that they sing and so forth. And so one of the things we wanted to do in this study was to go out and record bird song and see how it was different, differing along the gradient and see how birds respond to different songs. 
So this is Hans Slaverkorn, a postdoc of mine, now a professor at Leiden, and uh, Alex Kerschel, who did his PhD here at UCLA, and is uh, one of Dan Blumstein's, was one of Dan Blumstein's students. And uh, so when you go into the forest, obviously, uh, you turn your microphone on, and you're hoping to record the bird in question, but you never know what you might record. And I was wondering if every, anyone recognized uh, it recognizes this this species. This is a bird that Hans recorded one morning. Well, I can assure you, it was not a green bull. Um, it was a lowland gorilla that was uh, sleeping, and Hans stumbled upon it. Hans came back to the camp, and he was ashen. He was covered in mud, and we said, "What happened?" And he said. I recorded a gorilla. <laughs> and so we did what, of course, uh, we were very interested in exactly what happened. So we took our Baca guides back to the site where uh, Hans uh, 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 bumped into the gorilla and did a little jungle CSI. And what we learned, the Baca guides, what they learned is that what they told us was that actually the gorilla and Hans stood up, made three large paces, and both fell flat on their face, and then ran off in the opposite direction. <laughs> so, um, so what does the song of the Green Bull really sound like? Well, here it is. So a beautiful song. And what we found was that the, the frequencies and delivery rate and these other characteristics of song were differing between the forest and the ecotone. And what this is telling us then is that the, the, the differentiation in song is a, is a, a pattern that is, is very important in the, in the um, reproductive isolation of these species. And so uh, the, 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 it turns out that green bulls from the ecotone don't recognize the birds from the forest. And so this is a setting up a very important first step in the divergence to new species. So we've worked on green bulls now. We've looked at the same pattern along the gradient and other species, even chimpanzees. Katie Gonder did a wonderful study showing how chimpanzees are diverging along the gradient. We've looked at this in lizards. We've looked at it in other birds, such as this wattle eye and this blue-billed weaver. All the same story. So showing, showing that gradients are important for conserving adaptive variation is important is an important first step. But how do you begin to communicate this eye to the folks who are making decision, you know, uh, about what areas to protect? Now, we struggled with this one. And it was uh, back about 12 years ago, I guess, I was talking to a good friend of mine, Mark Reynolds, who's a senior scientist at the Nature Conservancy. And he said, you know, Tom, it's actually quite simple. You just need to map it. If you can map it, you can conserve it. And so we said, OK, we'll, we'll try to map it. Well, that turned out to be a little more difficult than we thought. It took about 10 years to figure out how to do that. But we got a, we got a grant from NASA to try to do this in Ecuador. And so uh, with funding from Ecuador, uh, funding from NASA, we started working along the gradients along the Andes, again, looking at the changes from the foothills up into the high mountains. And, um, Ecuador is a, was a great place to do this project for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's a mega diverse country. There are over 25,000 species of plants, 1,600 species of birds, 350 species of mammals, et cetera. And it's also an area that's under, um, uh, that uh, there's been a lot of deforestation. So between 84 and uh, 97, uh, there's very, very little forest that's been left uh, in the uh, western side of the Andes, only about 5% of the forest. So it's a, it was a good place to do this ex exercise to see if we could identify areas that we could um, preserve. And so what we did, we, um, this is a paper we, we published a few years ago. We First of all, we identified pattern. That's sort of the old traditional way that conservation organizations do. They look at species richness numbers of threatened species and so forth. They come up with a prioritization. But we added to this this whole question about process, about adaptive variation and where that's occurring. I'm not going to go through every little piece of this slide, but just get the idea that what we're doing is combining process and pattern. 
And we did this for a range of species, bird species, frog species, some plant species, a bat species. And we put all of these together and we mapped it. And we discovered three things from this analysis. The first is that we found that adaptive variation is in fact concentrated along these gradients uh, on both sides of the Andean uh, chain here. This is shown in red. Secondly, we found that 20% of the processes occur in current protected areas, only 20%. So this is kind of bad news. We had hoped that uh, there would be more of these gradients protected, but only 20% are. The protected areas are shown here in these black lines. The third thing we learned is that the gradients are also the ones predicted to be the most severely affected by climate change. And so these gradients are really key because that's where climate is going to be changing uh, most rapidly. So now we've shown that we can successfully map both biodiversity pattern and process and put it in a form that managers can use that decision makers can use, where we can start to make a difference. But this is only the first step. Having knowledge to solve a problem is just the first step towards a solution. But knowledge is not policy. So how do we bridge science and policy to really make this work? Well, universities need to be part of the solution. But too often, universities look like this. They're siloed. You know, the folks in engineering don't talk to the people in biology, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a big challenge. The other issue with universities is that they often build bridges, but they look more like this. The ivory tower is back here somewhere. We produce this wonderful knowledge. It rolls out on the drawbridge, and they say, read our papers. It's all there. And then the bridge goes back up, and that's it. Well, forget it. Another, another challenge is, uh, you know, we, we, we may build a bridge such as the infamous bridge to nowhere. But you know, we're, we're, we, we, we talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. So what kind of bridge do we need to build to really do this? Well, this is the kind of bridge I think we need to build. Now, everybody recognizes this as the Ponte Vecchio in Florence. This was built in the 19th, 9th century by the Medici family to connect both parts of Florence. But the bridge itself was a site of commerce. It was, it was a site of action itself. They, you know, many shops and so forth. You may have even bought something on this bridge. So this is the Vecchian principle that we hope to, um, that we've been um, promoting. Is that is that we must work at the intersection of knowledge and application and building bridges that are the site themselves of action. So what I'd like to do now is talk about three projects in which we are trying to build this kind of bridge in Central Africa. The first project is um, a year and a half ago, we formed the Central African Biodiversity Alliance. It's made up of scientists, policymakers, and two and uh, at two dozen different universities in Africa, Europe, and the US. And the goal of the project is to develop an integrated framework for conserving African biodiversity in the face of climate change that's evolutionarily informed and grounded in the socioeconomic uh, constraints of the region. And they're, they're, uh, we were very lucky to get a five million five year grant from the National Science F Foundation to, to push this forward. And we're, in, uh, we're just starting, we're about halfway through our second year. There are three parts of this approach. The first is a research approach. The second is an education and training approach. And the third is a policy component. Now, the research I've sort of told you about already. It's similar to the, to the Ecuador work that we're doing. Um, but it's a little different. Uh, there are about nine target taxa. We're working on everything from butterflies to chimpanzees. The steps in, in um, mapping adaptive variation uh, look like this. And there's a couple of different aspects to this work. The first is that we're also looking at future climate change. We're actually developing predictive models about where species are going to be, what habitats are going to be where under different climate scenarios, so we can better prioritize areas to protect. 
The second is uh, we're going to be taking socioeconomic issues into, a, into account. So for example, we might find that the best place for a new national park is down near Creeby where they're building the deep water port. Well, obviously, we wouldn't want to put one there. So we're trying to find that sweet spot where we can still protect biodiversity and do it in a context that's, that's, going, to be, that's going to be workable. The second leg of this project is education. And this is one of the most exciting parts of this project. Um, we have students from UCLA, other parts of US, coming together with African students, learning together to problem solve. This is a course we had in Gabon last year. It's this fantastic opportunity for training. Uh, we have uh, folks get into the field and do research together. They build collaborations. And they, in, in this case, they even published a paper from their research together. This is uh, Dennis Anye, very happily here, holding a, um, a chestnut flank sparrowhawk. I don't know if Gary or Joseph has seen one of these. But uh, this is quite a rare species. And uh, so this is the, some of the work that we're doing uh, with the courses. The third part of this is policy. Now, how are we, how are we engaging the policymakers? Well, we're doing things a little bit differently. Rather than waiting until the end of the study to bring in a report and giving it to someone and saying, OK, here's our recommendations, we've started working with the policy people before we started the research. We sat down with them in Yaoundé, all 15 ministries. We did it at the Ministry of Higher Education, which is neutral ground, which is a great place to do that because you know, there's a lot of competitiveness between ministries. But uh, so we, we, we sat down, we, we presented the project we're doing, and we're working with these folks now as colleagues to try to put together better approaches for how to preserve areas, how to gazette new national parks. So have we been able to successfully do anything? Well, not yet. This project is just getting off the ground. But I want to tell you about one success story that did happen. And uh, about in the early 19, in the mid-1990s, we started this project working on gradients. And I was contacted. We, it, we published a very influential paper that got a lot of press. And we were contacted by World Bank. And they said, can you, can you tell us more about these gradients? And we're, we're working with ExxonMobil to build a pipeline, an oil pipeline from Chad to the coast, a $7 billion pipeline. It was the largest construction project in Africa at the time. And we want to do some mitigation. And maybe we should protect some of these gradients. We want to find out more about it. So we worked with World Bank uh, over the course of about two years. And we and many other organizations were successful and having the government of Cameroon gazette a national park. This is the first ecotone park in Central Africa. It's 4,200 square kilometers, and it's just the rich area of, um, of this transition zone between forest and savanna. So we can do this. The second project focuses on the fundamental problem of higher education. Many of the best universities in Central Africa are collapsing. 44% of the population is under the age of 15. International development policies over the years have favored basic education over higher education. This is changing, but it's still pretty much the case. So what happens? The best and the brightest who leave these countries to go and get higher degrees basically never come back or very few of them. In the case of Cameroon, only 20% of the folks that go overseas for higher deg degrees ever come back. So the question then is, where, where will the next generation of African experts to deal with these challenges come from? The current approach doesn't work on the university scale. We build great centers of international development, but they're in LA, in New York, in San Francisco. They're based in the US or, the, or Europe. And scholars will, will parachute in for five or six years, set up, do great work, but it's not permanent. It's not integrative. It's not what we need for the long term. And so we need a new approach. And so this new approach, um, we, we started four years ago. We decided, let's build a center that's both permanent and interdisciplinary. And um, 
permanent in the sense that this isn't going to go away, that it's going to be there in perpetuity, and interdisciplinary in that the sense that we want to get economists and uh, uh, epidemiologists and folks together to solve issues such as waterborne diseases working together. The center that we created four years ago is here. It's uh, shown here. It's the uh, International Research and Training Center. It's a very modest operation right now. Uh, but we've, so far, we've had 1,000 scholars from 15 countries use this facility in the four, in the four years. And it's one-stop shopping. We help uh, scholars get, um, uh, we get sco help scholars get research permits. We help them with logistics. But most importantly, we put them in touch with local researchers from the seven universities so they can develop collaborative projects. And most importantly, this facility operates on a fee-for-use basis and operates in the black. So it's sustainable. You know, last month I think we earned an extra thousand dollars. We bought some light bulbs and some mattresses and some things. But it's, it's working. But we need to take it to the next level. And so this is the next level that we're going forward with. We're very, very pleased uh, working with Gensler, the architectural firm here in, in, in Los Angeles, is helping us divide, design essentially a green campus. We're working with four other NGOs, the Centre Pasteur, the Institute for Tropical Agriculture, and uh, the World Agroforest Center, combined over 200 years of experience on the ground. It includes uh, facilities such as a uh, distance learning center, a uh, uh, conference center, dormitories, and various laboratories. And so those folks at universities in Yaoundé and elsewhere don't, won't, won't have to leave the country, but can come and use these facilities and build collaborations. It's also a green facility. So uh, working with Gensler and their architects, uh, we are designing um, uh, energy efficient buildings. Uh, so instead of having concrete block, uh, you know, buildings with AC running 24-7, we, you know, this is actually sustainable. So it can be a model for um, what Africans can do with using local materials to build uh, green facilities. The main uh, areas of emphasis in this center uh, will be on, and at least initially, will be on um, water and health issues, food security, climate change, and biodiversity. Uh, these are just a list of some of the uh, facilities. The distance learning center is already underway. We're, we have a course at UCLA in the School of Public Health being taught by Hillary Godwin this quarter, which has UCLA students and, and uh, African students taking the same course in real time. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a morning class in, um, at UCLA and, in, and a late afternoon class in Cameroon, but it's, it's working. We also want to do some other things that are innovative. Uh, for example, we want to create a repair facility uh, for repairing lab equipment. Now you would think, well, why do you need that? Well, um, it turns out that if you're a scientist in the US and you have a, a centrifuge that doesn't work, you might say, well, geez, you know, it's, I'm going to buy a new one. I can send this to Africa, and hopefully someone can use it. Well, that's great. But it, if it breaks after two years, there's nobody to fix it. And so what we want to do is create a repair facility to repair this sort of equipment. I was visiting a, a colleague recently at uh, the University of Bouya. I was walking through his lab, and I, I, I said, uh, geez, Eric, that's a pretty nice spectrophotometer. And he said, you know, it is. Uh, it hasn't worked in 10 years. <laughs> but I keep it here just in case uh, a student sees one, and he'll know what it is. So we need to change the game here. And the other thing we want to do, we're working with a group in Silicon Valley uh, to provide a test bed for new innovative technologies. OK, how about dipstick technologies for diagno diagnosing diseases? There's all sorts of tremendous potential here. But you have to field test this stuff. And so we want to have a test center. And so that's another part of it. So we're, um, we're in full fundraising mode for this. But we're hopeful that this is going to take place. And this is just the phase one build out, the second phase. Is, uh, is even more um, exciting. I, I wish I had more time to tell you about it. Finally, the third project takes us back to the jaw and how we're working to protect this magnificent piece of rainforest. Um, last year, we went back to the jaw. And unfortunately, things aren't going so well right now. Um, the NGO that was uh, managing things has pulled up stakes. 
ran out of money. Again, the cycle of boom and bust in the in, in NGO world. And this is a common sight now. Uh, this is a mustache monkey and a female black cast hornbill hanging on a stick for sale. So what we're trying to do is, um, in this project, is we're trying to develop a way to protect the jaw by developing a RED project. Now, what's a RED project? A RED project, RED stands for Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation. Turns out that about 20% of the anthropogenic greenhouse gases come from deforestation when we cut down a forest. And so the RED project, the RED program, was first created by the United Nations to reduce forest loss in return for protecting forests and doing reforestation and helping local people find green jobs and protecting biodiversity and so forth. And for this, they could earn funds through the sale of carbon credits. Now, um, if systematically pursued, RED projects have the potential to address both climate change and the preservation of the world's forests. The funds for the protection of the, of the forests uh, will come from nations and industries that purchase credits on the carbon market, such as the one recently established in California, the carbon reduction law. So this is the, the concept for this, this, this RED program. Um, this is the jaw. This is the, uh, this is the main reserve. The buffer zone around this jaw is, uh, is, the, is going to be included in this RED project, and it constitutes 5,000 square miles. Okay, 5,000 square miles. That's 2,000 square miles larger than Yellowstone National Park. This is a major, major area of forest. It would sequester large amounts of carbon, and importantly, we have government approval. We're the first RED project in Cameroon where all the ministries came together and actually approved us to go forward. So we're very, very excited about this. We're moving forward. The duration of this particular project is probably 50 years. It may, may in the end, be 100 years, but it will generate revenues from the uh, sequestering of carbon. It aims to sell about six, uh, 68 million verified carbon units. A carbon unit is about one ton of carbon. 30% of the profits will go to communi community development funds. 15% will go to the Republic of Cameroon. 25% will go to investors. And 30% will go back to the NGOs, Forest Live and, and our NGO, that we can then put back into new RED projects and things like the Center for Integrative Development and building that out. So we're very excited about that. Um, much of the success of this, of course, is going to depend on the carbon market. Unfortunately, the carbon market has been all over the place. Uh, it's been as high as, uh, you know, almost $35. Now in Europe, it's about $1.50. So, we, you know, there's uncertainty here with respect to the carbon market, but even at low levels of, even at even $2 uh, a, a ton, this project is doable. But we need to do a lot more. I mean, right now, if you look at subsidies for oil, there are four, there are 480 billion dollars. You add, uh, it's over 500 billion if you add um, of, of, of biofuels to that. Right now, there's about a billion dollars going into red projects. We hope by by 2020 there'll be 30 billion. But I think things are changing. I mean, this is a, this is a piece from the New York Times uh, published back in December. It turns out that more than two dozen of the nation's largest corporations, including five of the major oil companies, all the major oil companies, are planning their future growth on the expectation that the government will be forced to, to basically, will, will basically force them to put a price on carbon pollution to control global warming. So if we can make this happen, the RED project, we have a chance that we can protect this magnificent biodiversity of the jaw, its fantastic species, but also its people. And um, so working together, I sincerely hope that we can make the next scramble for Africa about sustainability, both for its people and for its biodiversity. With that, I'd like to thank all of the folks that uh, contributed to this project, too many to name um, individually. 
and uh, the, the various funders that have uh, given us funding over the years. Thank you very much.